Well, let's just call this day another. We are back on the Rit Race. It's Dave Trafford with uh, John Wright doing the uh, daily podcast and uh, happy to welcome in Brett James. He is a uh, co-founder and a principal at uh, Sussex Strategy. Thanks for joining us, Brett. It'd be good to have your insights on some of this. Happy to talk to both of you. So l- let me just start by, you know, kind of reframing where we were last week. And, and Brett, you know, you'll, I suspect you have seen the same things. And we were talking, John and I, about the lack of a ballot question, their lack of a reason for going to the polls. And so what was happening clearly with some of the other parties and campaigns we were beginning to see them take the opportunity to define themselves and their own agenda, their own ballot question, if you will. And Singh and O'Toole kind of jumped out immediately and grabbed affordability by the throat sooner you know, than the prime minister certainly did. And there was some traction around that. But one of the things that struck me as we make the turn into week number two, I heard um, Aaron O'Toole on John Moore's show this morning on News Talk 1010. And they talked about all of the things that you need to talk to the leader about. But one thing that kind of seeps through that conversation with O'Toole right now is that the underlying message is, I'm not the former leader and I'm not your dad's conservative party. Now, he's not really banging a drum on that, but I think it's an important thing to sort of take note of right now as we make the turn into week two. I think he's, you know, he he bridges a couple of generations, I think, because you know, he grew up. He grew up a progressive conservative. His dad is progressive conservative MPP in Ontario, um, and and he's of an age though that he understands that you know the the public the public has has shifted over time. It's no longer um, a, a time where you can be you know uh, hawkish on on deficits and debts to the point that you get easily painted as somebody who's going to bring in austerity measures. That's not where the, where the public is at. I think that the social conservatives, which, you know, let's face it, are, are still, there's, there's, a, there's a cadre within the party that pushes a social conservative agenda. Aaron's very much not one. So, you know, he's quite comfortable in, um, in tracking towards a, a much more progressive conservative agenda, which you'll see, and I'm certainly um, seeing as it rolls out day by day, very much focused on those liberals who were disenchanted with Justin Trudeau. Even, you know, you think back to the coalition that Mike Harris created in the 1990s, where he got a lot of rank and file union members to vote for him in Hamilton and Oshawa, because he spoke to pocketbook issues, to union rights issues, even if they took it took uh, issue with the union leadership. I see that same kind of thing happening with Aaron, and I think that it's it's having some traction. It's funny you should say that because John Moore almost challenged O'Toole when, on the radio interview and saying, well, how do you gain any traction here? Every time Trudeau says, I'm for this, you're saying, yeah, we will agree with that as far as Afghan refugees are concerned. Uh, we're okay with, you know, fill in the blank where there's more uh, similarity between their approach to things, whether it's on access to abortion or y- you name it, some of these what would have been wedge issues. John viewed that as a negative. I mean, I think to your point, when we look at what happened in Nova Scotia, you're taking your politics then to where the people are. Yeah, I think that the the risk on the other side for the conservatives who say, well, you're not conservative enough for me, um, where where are they going to go? Um, and how many of them are actually going to go somewhere? I'm not a, I'm not a pollster, but my my view is they're still strong enough in Alberta. You know, they're could they lose a seat because of something's tight? I don't know, maybe. But in a place like Ontario, and I, I you know, hate to be that central Canadian who says it's all about Ontario, but I think that's where this thing's going to come down to. Um, it, it, this, this more mainstream appeal is, as you said, that's where the voters are at. And I think that's where he's headed and headed quite comfortably. This is not a, I need to invent myself as something. This is who Aaron is. So it come, the authenticity, I think, also comes across, and that's, that's key in any campaign, especially a short one where you don't have a lot of time to make your impression upon voters. You know, it takes me back to the Mike Harris years, that even though the common sense revolution was pretty hard-edged, it was Dave Johnson, the former mayor of East York, who was head of education at the time, and dealt with the unions, and it was a pretty 
big turf battle. And what came out of that was a new phrase in politics, um, crafted by people in his office, tested by polls, and it was, we just want to be fair and reasonable. And what I think is resonating at the moment with O'Toole, which people are being introduced to. I mean, it's not that they've had to get used to him. They are, they are seeing him. Is that you're hearing comments about he's reasonable. And I think that's the biggest thing that the Tories can gain at this stage. And that is that, you know, they don't see them as a threat. They see them as something that's being reasonable and they're willing to listen to that. So at this early stage, yes, they've got their five-point economic plan out. They've talked about housing. They've talked about ethics. I mean, there's a whole series of things they've talked about. They've even talked about health care, um, which is, in effect is just going back to what Jim Flaherty was doing. And that was, here's 6%, see you later, don't bother us, to each of the provinces. But I think, again, we're in the early days of this, and the complaint that no one knows Aaron O'Toole, well, they've saved it up, and they're now going to be putting it out there. And to your point, Brett, a lot of the seats are kind of where they were at the end of the last election campaign, but that 905 breadbasket in Toronto is just outside of the GTA. That's what the Prime Minister is going to have his eye on as well as as uh, Mr. O'Toole. And I would suspect that that's where we're going to see a lot of their bus tour at some point going into those areas because being reasonable and, and being somebody that can get to that group of people and be seen as an alternative is, in fact, where people want to put their votes. Well, I mean, we're um, you know just under a month away from Election Day. And right now, as both of you point out, we're in a place where we kind of left off on Election Day in 2019. Um, the difference, though, Brett, I think is that there would have been momentum around, you know, the Liberals going into that election. Certainly there was momentum around the, the Conservatives. But the conversation around getting a majority... Justin Trudeau needs something like 15 seats to do that. Right now, eight, 10 days into this campaign, um, it's looking like he's going to have a hard enough time just holding what he's got. Yeah, and I'm not, um, I am not suggesting who's going to win because there's a lot of time left here. Um, the, I think it would be foolish to suggest that the Liberals at this point in time aren't still poised to win a minority. Uh, just because of the factors we, we've we've been discussing, and um, and and those national numbers, John knows very well. They they don't mean a lot. It's the regional breakdowns that do mean a lot, and they still slightly favor the the liberals. There's I think there's no question. So do they have time to recover after what I think has been a, a fairly poor start in general to their campaign? They certainly do. Um, the, but, but the difference I, I feel, I had a discussion with a, a well-known conservative strategist, a week, just, just after the campaign had launched. And he was lamenting that at that point in time, we would have been, we'd still be better. We, the conservative party of Canada slipping up in my, in my old age, they, the conservative party would still be better if it had Andrew Scheer as leader, because he was known and he made headway in that last campaign. And he would go into this in a better spot. And I said, that's wonderful. I, I see why you say that. But he was and will forever be fighting the hidden agenda issue, the social conservative element. He could not bring himself to put a fork in that. And um, and that was going to haunt uh, again and again. So uh, I, I believe it was right to change. And I, I know that that conservative party is known for eating its young, as it were. There, there haven't been too many leaders get a second crack at something. And that's sometimes folly in itself. In this particular case, I think they, they head into this election and now whatever we are, 10 days into it, with a leader who has much more opportunity for appeal in the mainstream to and to peel off disaffected liberal voters. And I, I can only say anecdotally that, uh, you know, I know many, many liberals who will who will be liberal until the day they go to a grave, but they have a very, very hard time voting for Justin Trudeau. And similarly, those that support Trudeau are so diehard. That's where the Trump comparisons come in. They are going nowhere. They will follow him to the ends of the earth. Um, 
so the, the question is, you know, can how much can they grow their coalition behind beyond those acolytes and keep some of those uh, disaffected liberals on both flanks, which is another challenge, I think, where, you know, Jagmeet Singh is, I think, starting to find his feet a little bit and gain a little traction. And, and that's also, you know, dangerous for Trudeau. I think for our listeners, what's important is to try and figure out where this all comes out with in terms of seats right now, because the polls, if we take for the last week or so, which are now all coming out to be at about 32 to 31 or 31 to 30 percent, are kind of where we were at the last election campaign. But what does that mean in terms of seats? So for all of the sound and fury, um, the Liberals are down one seat, if you put the seat model together, from 157 to 156. The Tories, in fact, are up six from 121 to 127. The NDP are up three from 24 to 27. The Green is down one from three to two. And in Quebec, the Liberals, in fact, are up six and the Bloc is down six. So, I I mean, really nothing has changed since the last election, if you move into this week. But where we're seeing some changes are in Ontario. Now, we have to remember that the Liberals picked up an awful lot of seats there. However, they, they sit at 73 seats in the province and that's down six. The Tories are up four to 40. The NDP are at eight. Um... And that's up two. So, again, I want to I want to try and put this in perspective. No one has got a big advantage over the last week, no matter what momentum you may feel. Um, there are some modest changes in the landscape from the last election campaign. So, if you'd gone back a month ago and you tried to do the same model, the Liberals would have been sitting at between 170 and 185 seats. So that would have been a majority government. Right now, they're holding on to the same minority levels and basically with the other parties as they were at the dissolution of, I mean, at the end of the last campaign. So let me ask both of you then, because, you know, as we go through this as much, and I think early on, Brett, we were discussing, is this going to be won by a war room or is this going to be won by knocking on doors and, you know, actually FaceTime with with voters? My sense so far is that the war rooms are the ones that are fighting this out. And to John's point, whether we think the polling matters or not right now, whether we think the seat projections matter or not right now, there's a certain perception that might outweigh the numbers that John has just laid out as far as Canadians are looking at each one of the parties and the party leaders. Where's How, how does that play into this? Because the psyche of the voter isn't something you can pull on, but it's clearly going to be critical as we move into the last few weeks of the campaign. Yeah, I, th- I think that the biggest danger f- that I see in that dynamic is, is is again to Prime Minister Trudeau and the and the Liberals because I I think that I think that there's a narrative that's already beginning to set in and they that it, there's two parts to it they, there's there's still this underlying why are we having an election again um, people don't really understand and and if if they had come out and I'm sure it was obviously a very deliberate choice if they had come out with a, here's clearly what we're going to do for you if we are reelected and started to establish their own narrative of why this election was needed and what they're going to do that's new and different, because of course they've been governing for years, then I think that they could have avoided what I think is the current dynamic where O'Toole has set the agenda by being aggressive, saying what he was going to do, established himself as a credible candidate where most people didn't know him. And I, and I think that there's there's a lot of catch up to do in the war room because, you know, I, I hear what John's saying that, yeah, it, uh, all of that, there's really only one seat difference at the moment. And, and you can call it momentum or we can call it something that starts to set in. But I think that those who were already iffy about the prime minister and how they felt about him, but felt they had no alternative and felt that there's no way I can go to the conservatives under a couple of the past leaders, suddenly have an alternative. And where where it does get, where it will be one is definitely on the ground. It's not in the war rooms. So to me, that's twofold. There's a deliberate strategy of, of taking to the airwaves digitally, which O'Toole is pursuing aggressively, 
because I think that makes uh, he he can have a far bigger impact than making an announcement in Kitchener and an announcement in Halifax. Yes, those get the media of the day and they get media on the bus, but it's the it's the it's the twofold the overall narrative that's coming driven largely by mainstream media, but it's that direct connection with voters, which is much more digital now than it is in meeting them in a church basement, for instance, he can get many, many more people in a more effective way. So long-winded way to say that I think it, it's, it's, it's the fact that it, there's a narrative setting in about this campaign that is going to be a lot of hard work for the Liberals to undo. You know, Dave, the only thing I would add to that would be that in the last five days, we've seen the Liberals look pretty desperate. I mean, they've been throwing billions of dollars around. They've made some I think tactical mistakes in terms of what they've chopped up of the video of you know the healthcare discussion and things mm-hmm. like that. I think there's a sense of I'm not going to call it panic, but I think that there is a real sense that the barbarians are at the gate. When in fact, if you had an adult in the room, perhaps who looked at the numbers I'm looking at in front of me, I'd say, "Hey, everybody, settle down." I mean, it's not like we're in a, you know, the majority is coming across and and smothering us. We are where we were. We just have to make every day count. I mean, if I were a liberal right now in that whatever room it was, I'd say, let's not be desperate. We've got a number of weeks ahead in this campaign. Um, We're going to earn every day and we're going to do it with some discipline instead of throwing these big ideas around. We've got a record that we can we can deal with. And we still have the prime minister who at this stage is the one that earns the most points when in public opinion as being the one who's most prime ministerial and that, you know, the certain groups of people in this country want to see. We have to remind ourselves that you win a majority with fractions, not with majorities. You you win a majority with 38% of the vote. And so there's seven points away from that. So I, again, I think that they feel that that there's been momentum. And Brett, you framed it perfectly. They feel that there's momentum from the conservatives because they're sliding backwards. I mean, that's Einstein's relativity theory right there. I mean, you know, we're getting ahead because the other guy's going backwards. It, the reality is that that's where they are. And they are, they're incredibly panicked, I think, seeing where they are in these numbers. But, but again, to what Brett said, the core of the liberal vote still is sticking with them. They're not moving away from them. And so for others, even in the uh, NDP or the Tories, to feel that momentum, it's great. But it's, it's because the other is sliding back as opposed to you necessarily moving ahead. Well, I know much has been said about the, the dynamic in Quebec. We're hearing about the dynamic shifting in British Columbia. Brett, uh, Mr. Singh's name comes up prominently in both of those regions. It, at you know the day after election day is is that really going to make a difference? I mean, to your point, you know Ontario being the real jewel here that you have to win. But if you're talking about you know some really slim margins around making any kind of gains, uh, the NDP I think is the one that kind of is the the uh, the outlier here in terms of who can make a difference in the campaign. Maybe not the Liberals or the Conservatives. That and I would add to your list the the ring just outside of the 905 that John was describing, because I I think that there's an opportunity to pick off a couple of seats um, in in traditional NDP strong areas where the Liberals could now be a little bit vulnerable. So, Mm -hmm. you know, to your to your point, uh, you know, all of it, all of it adds up, though, to holding the Liberals to a minority potentially under today's current scenario, as John laid out well. Um, the uh, Obviously, the Conservatives need a strong NDP showing in certain places in order to have a chance to form their own government. And right now that, you know, the, 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 the NDP is showing uh, in a way, I think, that will hearten some Tories, too. Um, and you know, I, you know, I agree with uh, some of your earlier analysis about the self-immolation of the Green Party. There was a, the, there was a tremendous opportunity in this election that they squandered, um, and I think are going to be relatively a, a non-factor, uh, which um, may suit may suit the Prime Minister well. Uh, it doesn't play into some of those other scenarios. Mm-hmm. You, you know, the other thing too, I'd be interested, Brett, in your comment on this. Um, the one thing I've noticed 
even in my own riding, which is in downtown Toronto, I don't know who the conservative candidate is. I look in other parts of Toronto, and there's a couple of wards where we don't have a former city councilor running, we don't have a former MPP running, we have a school board trustee and the Catholic school board, which is not to take anything away, but it, it's almost like the national leaders in certain parties may be getting the benefit of good polling numbers, but the ground game is where you win elections. I mean, and there, you know, you you want to have good candidates. You want to make sure that you've got nominations that have taken place, especially in areas where you might win. And I'm, I just get the sense that that Jagmeet Singh, you know, may be popular, but he hasn't done his homework. And you need to be on the ground to do that. And the secondly, I, I wonder whether or not the Tories have got all of their candidates lined up and at least they're visible. So I'll give you an example. We are in Carolyn Bennett's riding. And people, you know, who are long liberals would sort of say, oh, there's no chance that she'll stay there and maybe she should have retired, but she'll she'll take that. But the reality is that it is provincially represented by a, an ndp -er who came in after Eric Hoskins left. And... And while she may be renting the riding, if you want to put it that way, they also now have a strong federal potential um, MP. I mean, they've got a new candidate who's who's got a lot of charisma that could come into this area. And if you want to park a safe vote, you park it there. You know, if you're a liberal, and you don't want the Tories and you park it with the NDP. And I just wonder whether or not we have bare spots for some of these leadership um, or, or for these campaigns that in fact are not going to produce the seats that we think it's going to produce because the local candidates are just not there. Uh, if there was, you know, beyond, uh, I guess beyond the fact that he didn't necessarily impress in the last campaign the way many thought he might, uh, they, it was the NDP ground game that seemed to really let them down. Um, and and it's an area where traditionally they punched above their weight. Uh, got the union support and, and volunteers out in a way that other parties were challenged to do. And again, to compare it, since we're t you know talking about Battleground Ontario, in, in Ontario, um, the, the unions have been very pragmatic in banding together and putting their resources behind those that they think are most likely to win. And, and that has been the Liberals for the last number of elections where they, they've garnered most of that union support. I think that the NDP are, are challenged by that same dynamic federally uh, as well, given that, given that we have a sitting Liberal government. Um, yeah, those holes, uh, I, I, I agree. I think it's an issue. I think that what it, what it means is there are several incumbent ridings, and I think probably skews to the benefit of the Liberals, where there, there is not the, the challenge and the challenger that there might otherwise be. And to some degree, um, uh, you know, thinking of from a conservative perspective, I, I think that there's some ridings where they, you know, they want to, they, they obviously are going to run a candidate in every riding. They want to put up a good show, but they are not going to expend any additional resources in anything that's not close to winnable. It's just not going to happen. And there are ridings where they, they, they know, of course, where exactly those swing ones are. All the resources would go there, including uh, asking those that are well resourced with no chance to win to send their money elsewhere. That's That's active too. So... Uh, and that's not an easy dynamic in the world of the inside baseball of, of politics. It's hard to get one riding to put their money to go support another um, when they've worked so hard to raise it to help their own local candidate. But it's a dynamic that is real at the moment and can help to make the difference in some of those swing ridings. You know, one question I have is on the digital side, because we've had in Ontario, Ontario Proud, which is being the digital campaign mm -hmm. arm to, you know, and and... And now it's it's Canada uh, proud, and the same group of people who have organized that are are heading out. How much, how much of a um, of a threat does that pose to uh, to the Liberals? I mean, to your point, I mean it was that they were doing, um, you know, going into Facebook and, and targeting the messaging around, you know, the the micro outlets. What do you think that the the threat is going to be there? Well, I'm a I'm a big believer in it, and and at Sussex we run a lot of campaigns to move public opinion on specific issues for our clients. So we use those very same tools every day, and there's nothing that's more effective in 2021 than that 
targeted digital campaign across across all age groups. I mean, people think that, well, okay, yeah, you're going to get the millennials using those type of tactics. Well, the millennials aren't on Facebook and Facebook's the biggest advertising platform in the world now. And you're getting your 55 pluses on, on Facebook, nowhere else. Um, as we've talked about before, the, the last Ontario campaign was the first time that, that no campaigns took a, spent any money on newspaper advertising, period. I mean, that's, that's just a, such a sea shift. So what kind of a factor is that? I, I think that, you know, Trudeau, when he won in 2015, uh, the digital game was seen very much as, as being a, a key strength to, to how he won. Uh, 2019, I think the Conservatives started to play a little bit of catch up. And now with that Ontario base that you're talking about, uh, I think that they've really perfected it. I think that they understand uh, where to spend the time and the money and how to reach those voters. I think it's going to have an outsized effect on this campaign. And it's not something that it's not something that you see easily until until it happens, because it is targeted. Mm -hmm. I'm going to see an ad that, that you're not going to see, John, and you may not see, Dave, because it's targeted at me. So you don't have the full page ad. You don't have the constant barrage of the TV. You've got very specific things targeted at me because of what I care about, because they know if, if, if so-and-so down the street who is a conservative voter looks a lot like me, I don't mean physically, their, their demographic profile, their income, their kids' interests, whatever, I'm likely to like that too. And you do the L'Oreal commercial, the and they told two friends and they told two friends. I, I think it's going to have a far bigger impact than people uh, currently are thinking about or that you see talked about in mainstream media. So given that, you know, evolution and, you know, this, let's face it, the genie's been out of the bottle for a while on this. And many of us, you know, certainly in the mainstream media, just kind of catching up to it. Brett, earlier in the, in the series, John and I were sort of discussing the, the, the need to have a national platform, whether or not that has any meaning anymore. It, the way you have described this almost makes it sound as if, you know, a platform approach is irrelevant. I mean, you can be so specific and targeted if you're smart about your advertising digitally that you can give John Wright his own personal platform. I, I think that platforms in general and that particular platform is an amalgam of regional and interest targeted uh, platform planks, if you will. The five things that he's running on are, are a, a you know, taking A, the most popular, and B, sort of generalizing a few of those categories and putting it in something that is easily digestible, easily repeatable, largely for mainstream media. But then within that, in that however many pages that document was, there are very specific pieces that are targeted at very specific voter groups. And that's that's where they intend to have the, the more localized effect. Um, so just before we go, we'd be remiss if we... Uh finish this show without uh, talking about the passing of Charlie Watts today, the uh, legendary drummer for the Rolling Stones. Um, I don't think Brett's going to have much of a, an effect on the, on the campaign trail, but uh, you know, three guys that are of our age, I'm just thinking um, I'm, I'm feeling a little lonely this afternoon when I hear that news. I saw, you know, he was rightly described by somebody this afternoon as the, the steady heartbeat of, of the Stones. And, you know, with all due respect to bass players who may be on this uh, on this podcast and like to believe that they drive every song, <laughs> uh, I think that that Charlie was very much that. And uh, and you know, my goodness, um, uh, of all of the musical accomplishments, and we could spend a, more than one podcast just on the Rolling Stones and Charlie Watts. Uh, the most impressive thing is he met his wife before the band ever formed, and they're they're still married to this day, which is uh, in the rock and roll world doesn't happen very often. So good on both of them, and very sorry to boy, talk about an end of an era. Um, I just I can't picture what that their family, their broad family, how they feel about that. But you know, more, you know, for the for the world. Uh, We've we've known that band since we were all kids, and and it's like one of those mm -hmm. constants that suddenly has changed. And I'm I'm I miss David Bowie, and I miss Prince, and I miss Lou Reed, 
but the stones i mean it's just another another level i think and uh it's 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 a sad day in that regard well, John, it's almost as when the announcement came out, you know, died quietly with his family by his side. And to, mm. to Brett's point, it was just so not Keith Moon <laughs> kind of exit to, uh, fr- uh, from the rock and roll stage. And John Bonham, too. Um, yeah, exactly. Which is a whole other story right there. You know what? It, it, uh, I think there's a, a part of our own mortality that when someone who's been part of your life that long, when they pass away, it challenges your own identity. I mean, when uh, the bass player from ZZ Top passed away at the age of 71, I mean, that's not too far off from where I am. And I would have said, boy, he had a hell of a life and probably took, you know, years off of it in all the stuff that he was doing. On the same hand, though, we're talking about a drummer for a band who's 80 years of age, one of the most prolific bands in the history of the world, who has seen more sex, rock and roll, drugs, drink, anything you want to throw at it, and still lived to be 80 years of age. So I got to tell you, despite him passing away today, I feel pretty optimistic having not lived that life to maybe get beyond 80. So it's a, it's an unfortunate circumstance, but oh my God, he's 80 and lived with the Rolling Stones right up until now. Well, that, uh, yeah, that was the marriage, too, that stuck together that long. So uh, it, it speaks volumes. Anyway, I just thought I, I realized it got nothing to do with us getting to the ballot box in September. But uh, it's just one of those benchmark moments that we'd be remiss not to uh, not to mark. Brett James, thanks for joining us this afternoon. It's great to have you. Great to be here and uh, look forward to the rest of this campaign. Brett James at uh, Sussex Strategy. John Wright, of course, at uh, Maru Public Opinion. I'm Dave Trafford. This is The Rit Race. It's an eye contact podcast.